when Russia and Japan will come to blows over issues of their expansions or their attempted expansions into Manchuria, uh, the Tsar at that time is Nicholas II. He had been coronated in um, 1894 and of course is the last Tsar of Russia and, and certainly that is in many ways um, unfortunate that, that for, for Russian history that this individual in particular came to the throne at such a, a crucial moment in, in both global history and Russian history. Um, he is um, weak-willed, uh, not particularly intelligent, um, for the lack of a better word, uh, Tsar Nicholas II um, is, is essentially a, a nincompoop, um, a, a term that one doesn't hear often today, but one I think that is um, very apt for the way we could describe this uh, very weak-willed, uh, vacillating individual. And um, making matters worse, of course, the Tsar is clinging to the old autocratic system. Despite um, all these pushes for reform from inside, um, uh, Tsar Nicholas, having witnessed the death of his uh, grandfather, Alexander II, uh, when he was assassinated, when he was a child, um, is is very close-minded to any kind of um, resurgence of reform that his grandfather had initiated and, and that in a kind of strange way actually led to his death at the hands of uh, Russian anarchists. And so um, the Tsar is a, claims of course to be a Russian nationalist, a chauvinist, um, Russians, of course, are celebrating their uh, racial supremacy over both the Chinese and Japanese. Um, the, the idea that Russia somehow would have to take account of uh, Japan's interests in China for many Russians is um, ridiculous. And moreover, the, Russia and its administration are very incompetent, including in its foreign relations. Um, all sorts of mixed messages are coming from the Russian government on the eve of that war. Um, uh, the Russians make all sorts of assurances that uh, their intentions are peaceful, that they will be cooperative, they will maintain an open door policy, and yet with their other hand, um, their threatening war and aggression of their interests are somehow impeded in uh, Manchuria. So it, it, it's a very, very conflicting public policy to the point that nobody really understands exactly what um, the Russians want, but certainly there is a sense of um, threat felt in Japan um, over the issue of, again, Manchuria and expansion into, into China. And um, the issue, of course, primarily is Korea as well as uh, Russians are beginning to uh, suggest that maybe the Japanese will have to get out of Korea and uh, the Japanese in the meantime are, are doing their, their uh, best to tie the Russians down in their expansionism and things, are, as I say, are, are getting tense globally. As well, in the United States, there are, again, policy-making factions that suggest that if Russia and Japan go to war, um, that the United States will come on the Japanese side. And in fact, secretly, there is financing taking place of um, the Japanese mobilization to, to war, and Americans will secretly end up financing, in fact, both sides. Uh, you know, they are still um, 
building ships for Russia, building railway stock, the United States, but they're doing the same now for uh, Japan outside Russian view. And so progressively, Russia begins to now be portrayed in uh, particularly British uh, media as a threat to global peace. And in the United States as well, you begin to see um, anti-Russian propaganda emerging that is still built on top of those issues that I described in, in the introduction over the issue of anti-Semitism and uh, kind of the old repressive um, absolute monarchy that Russia is maintaining. Darkest Russia, um, in, in fact, is this show. It's, it's uh, a, a play about the rulers of Russia. It's, it's kind of very propagandistic about um, Russian authoritarianism. And so increasingly, uh, Russia is portrayed in the West as running amok. The Russians themselves um, have no sense of vulnerability in terms of what um, war with Japan will mean. Their assumption is very much like everyone else's, that Japan is not a white Christian nation and therefore is incapable of ever uh, landing a defeat on a country like a huge power like like, like Russia. And, and certainly Russian propaganda and Russian media uh, further, uh, you know, stresses this. Uh, Japan here in, in this cartoon is uh, shown uh, like a little creature, a little cockroach that the great Russian empire can crush instantly and just step over. As you can see in the background, uh, Chinese Russian, uh, Chinese, French, and Americans kind of plotting mischief while the Russians will preempt it with a quick step uh, into Korea and then they'll kick Japan here. Japonia is Japan, here is Korea under his other foot and then Manchuria of course is there. It's all about Manchuria. It's assumed that the Russian Navy will uh, make a short shrift of the, chi of the Japanese Navy, despite what um, the Japanese were capable of doing to the Chinese Navy. In fact, uh, essentially the Japanese destroyed the Chinese Pacific Fleet, what, what, what they had of it. And as far as Port Arthur goes, the warning again in Russian propaganda is uh, lay your hand to Port Arthur and you're going to have a, um, a handful of spine. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's a spiny, well-defended uh, fort. And again, you can see uh, American and uh, Chinese co-conspirators behind what is perceived as Japanese aggression towards Port Arthur. So all these messages um, are very, very mixed uh, until just like at Pearl Harbor, uh, the Japanese Navy sails onto Port Arthur. And it's a very modern and powerful Japanese Navy uh, that arrives at the gates of Port Arthur and proceeds to devastate Port Arthur and the Russian fleet that is uh, bottled in in the bay at, at Port Arthur. It's a huge disaster for the Russians. It's a shock you know, having their fleet destroyed. Um, and, and then, of course, um, Japanese infantry as well will engage with Russian troops and Japanese army prevails over the Russian army. It, it just decimates the Russian army. It's a double humiliation on the ground and at, at, at sea. It's a shock, not only to the Russians, it's a shock to the entire world. 
Um, and of course, it, it as well, this kind of surprise attack, uh, which the Japanese will, will repeat over and over in, in um, their future military strategy, as I say, right up to uh, Pearl uh, Harbor, the Russians actually uh, protest uh, that there wasn't a declaration of war, as you can see in this uh, cartoon. Um, you know, the Japanese do it now. Uh, Russia, no fair, I wasn't ready. Two weeks after the opening of hostilities, Russia sent a formal protest to all great powers against the alleged violation by Japan of the principles of international law in attacking her fleet at Port Arthur without a specific declaration of, of, of war. Well, you know, certainly the Russians are behind in times. And we can see, um, you know, le petit poussé, the little uh, flea was what um, the Russians referred to. Um, Japan as being, uh, oh, what a surprise it becomes as the Tsar loses control of his battleships and they sink, giving him the jiu-jitsu. And the French, of course, the French who have been aligning themselves with Russia, the French in a kind of a rivalry with Britain, um, while Britain is aligned with Japan, the French are aligning themselves with Russia. The French have become financing as well, the Russian railway system in the West, uh, partly in the hope of bringing Russia into an alliance with France. And, and, and so the French are willing to upgrade the Russian railway system so that the Russians can mobilize um, if the French go to war with 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 Germany, as Germany is slowly beginning to merge uh, a threat to the balance of power in the European continent. Um, and, and so the French, in some ways, are egging the Russians on. As you can see the caption in this, France, um, keep it up, Russia, you're winning, Russia. Well, if this is uh, winning, what will he do to me if I lose? And so it's a great victory for Japan, the sinking of the Russian fleet. Um, this makes Japan now the first non-Christian, non-white great power. It joins um, Britain, France, uh, Germany, Austria, and um, the United States as um, Italy, if I hadn't mentioned it, as one of the great uh, powers in, in, in the world. Uh, and, and, and it's, as I say, a shock to everybody. And it, it, it just rattles everybody's sense of uh, race uh, that, that a, as, as I said, a non-white, non-Christian power could do this to a huge Christian imperial power like Russia. And again, um, from the Russian point of view, the British, American, and uh, Japanese collusion in this is uh, just another um, example of a kind of conspiratorial politics that are um, aimed at Russia since the Crimean War. And, and um, again, there is a kind of, as, as it becomes evident to the Russians, that the United States is financing some of Japan's war debt in this um, uh, war. It uh, becomes evident to Russia that the United States might not be that kind of reliable um, partner that it had been throughout most of the 19th century. Russia, of course, cannot stand to take the destruction of its fleet at Port Arthur without responding. The Russians now mobilize another fleet. They intend to send their fleet out from uh, Crimea through the Turkish Straits, down the Suez Canal, and up into 
the sea of Korea, of um, the Korean Peninsula, where they intend to attack and take revenge on the Japanese fleet. This is not going to happen. Uh, the British end up bottling in the Russians. They will not cooperate with Russian passage through the Suez Canal. The Turks also, uh, since Russia is a belligerent at war, uh, the Turks also now impose the Straits Convention, restricting Russian travel through the Straits. And so instead, Russia has to launch its Baltic fleet way up in the north. It has to make its way past England, dock and reef coal at Morocco, then proceed down the coast of Africa. Uh, it docks again in West Africa. Um, by the time it gets to um, Lower Southwest Africa, what is today Namibia, at that point was a German colony. Much of the crew now um, are sick with malaria and other diseases. Um, the Russians end up um, confused going from port to port at uh, Madagascar, as, as well as French, it's a French colony, as the French resupply the Russian ships there. And only now, can the Russians join up with um, the original route that they had planned uh, to attack the Japanese and take revenge. And, and so in May, they arrive off the coast of uh, Korea, and there you have uh, the Battle of the Tsushima Straits, May 27th, May 28th, um, in which the Russians intend, as I say, to take revenge and break the Japanese naval power by destroying the Japanese fleet. And, uh, of course, what happens is the Japanese promptly sink the second Russian fleet. And this is twice the disaster that um, had transpired uh, at Port Arthur the year before. This is the ultimate humiliation of, of, of Russia. And of course, it's also um, levels now Japan to the level of, of as I say, a, a absolutely unchallenged great power in um, the Pacific. And, and of course, this is the moment that um, the Japanese empire essentially finds its um, vision of expansion. Uh, the Pacific now uh, has uh, become a territory that Japan intends to claim for itself, and all that will come to a climax, of course, uh, on December 7th, 1941, where the Japanese now will turn against the Americans, primarily still over the same issue, Manchuria and Japanese rivalry with American, British, and French uh, interests in uh, Manchuria at, at, at that time. Uh, same story, same tune, um, just, you know, a slightly different beat to it. The victory, of course, uh, consolidates uh, Japanese hold over the Leilong Peninsula. They now take back Port Arthur. They uh, take control over the Manchurian railways. Um, Formosa uh, now is, as I say, permanently part of Japan as Korea as well. I think 19... Um, or 1909, somewhere in there, Korea is now incorporated just as a part of Japan. It will be, you know, it'll be Japan essentially until 1945. And as well, the Russians lose right there half of Sahalin Island, this critical island uh, that used to belong to Russia, uh, that uh, now um, the Russians lose a half of it. And so essentially the Russians find themselves bottled in 
once again at Vladivostok, a cold uh, water um, port. There's, um, you know, there's no sailing out of Vladivostok in the deep winters. Um, and, and, and of course, as well, the Russian railway expansion now um, is, is going to be controlled. And as you can see by, by the nature of the, the, the final peace settlement, the Portsmouth uh, conference, all, all this, you know, the Russians get some access uh, to um, the Chinese Eastern Railway that they have been uh, constructing, but a lot of territory in Manchuria, they have to give up uh, to the Japanese interests, and that absolutely includes uh, Korea. And the Americans essentially have been steering clear of, of, of this. They're trying to claim to be just innocent bystanders to this war. And yet, of course, we see that in the background, the various factions, there were um, pro-Japanese and pro-Russian factions that were uh, fighting each other. And, and of course, the, the, the um, both kind of prevail and the Americans essentially end up playing both sides of, of, of the game. And that certainly is acknowledged in American media at that, at that time. Roosevelt presides over the Portsmouth, Portsmouth um, Peace Conference. And as a result, uh, Roosevelt for his negotiation of this uh, peace conference, which of course is very favorable to Americans from both sides, uh, from the Russian end and from the Japanese end. Um, Roosevelt, of course, will be the first American to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. It had just been um, instituted maybe three or four years prior, um, but uh, Roosevelt will become, as I say, the first American to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his negotiation of the, the, Sino, the, con the conclusion of the Russo-Japanese War. And immediately, uh, Commodore Perry and the American fleet, 1908, pay a very friendly visit to Japan. Japanese-American relations are just blossoming, as are Japanese-British relations. And of course, when World War I begins, um, as a result of these alliances with the United States, with um, England, uh, Japan will come on the side of the Allies in the First World War, unlike the Second. The problem for Russia, of course, is, is that um, this defeat in the East uh, causes internal uprisings. Um, it, it leads to the 1905 revolution that um, is a almost universal revolution in, in, in Russia. All classes rise up, in, including a faction of the uh, um, even aristocracy join in, demanding a modernization and a democratization of the Russian uh, monarchy. Um, you, you know, of course, the examples of uh, Germany and Britain as constitutional monarchies have uh, been, you know, often advanced by less radical Russian reformers who are not necessarily calling for the overthrow of the monarchy, but for a, as I say, a democratization, a liberalization of, of the monarchy. And you do have, as I say, this very popular uh, revolution or an attempt at a revolution in, in 1905. And of course, it results in um, uh, these massacres by Cossacks and uh, Russian imperial troops of demonstrators. Um, 
this, of course, further alienates the Russian population. And once again, this kind of um, unbridled brutality with which uh, many of the demonstrators are uh, put down by Cossack cavalry, of course, does not resonate well with progressives in the United States. Um, however, again, with conservatives, a lot of them have sympathy for this, and a lot of them want to call out, you know, American Cossack uh, troops, had they had them, against uh, labor union demonstrations at, at, at home. So, again, American policy toward what is happening in Russia vacillates between um, these kinds of progressive and conservative factions inside the United States that are facing their own issues. But for Russia, this revolution is, is, is going to be the beginning of the end. Even though the revolution is suppressed, um, Russia will now have this open social wound. Um, and in the period between 1905 and 1917, when the next revolution will, will occur, um, of course, the Tsar clings to his power. He clings to the old style way of, of ruling and, and nothing much changes. And, and so, as I say, it remains this open social wound um, in the pre-war period that is only going to get worse by the time uh, the First World War breaks out. And, and of course, Russia is sucked into that war as everyone else will be. 1905, of course, in Soviet, Russian Soviet iconography is often seen as a kind of proto-Bolshevik revolution, like, for example, uh, you know, the mutiny on the battleship Potomkin is often in uh, the hierarchy of Russian communist revolutionary events. Um, it, in fact, it wasn't. It was a mutiny of sailors under, of course, a very oppressive naval regime at that, that, that time. But it is appropriated, of course, by the Bolsheviks later after their revolution in 1917, or coup d'etat actually, um, it's appropriated as, as a, a proto-Bolshevik event. This is the moment that, of course, Lenin, so important to the founding of the Soviet Union, um, his wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, are now forced to go into exile. And in, in many ways, the Russian revolution that is coming, the communist revolution is kind of engineered for a long time in exile from abroad as Lenin and Krupskaya find themselves among other fellow revolutionaries um, in exile wandering from place to place. Um, the Lenin uh, first settles in Britain. In fact, he'll visit London frequently. There's a number of uh, houses that Lenin resided in in England uh, prior to the 1905 revolution and after the 1905 revolution. In fact, one of the earliest uh, Russian Bolshevik party congresses was actually held in London, not in, in Russia. Here's a one of the apartment buildings uh, that Lenin lived in in 1905, 16 Percy Circus. Lived in other places, 1908. He eventually, Lenin and Krupskaya drift down to the Villa Blazeuse um, in Capri in Italy where they become guests of a major Russian writer, Maxim Gorky. This is what the place kind of looks like today. It's a hotel known as the Villa Krupp. And it's here on this terrace that um, famously Lenin plays a series of uh, chess games with Gorky and other um, high profile visitors of, of uh, Gorky's. There's a picture of Lenin on, on that terrace, 1908 at the chessboard with, with that kind of derby 
quite not quite the image that we normally have of 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 of, of Lenin. Those games that uh, Lenin played, the, the, the moves were all recorded. You can go on various um, chess websites and replay against Lenin, a chess game, if, if, if you like, of your own, or study his moves. It's available. Gorky, of course, is uh, important in, in both um, pre-revolutionary, revolutionary, and post-revolutionary Russia. He is a contemporary of um, Alexei Tolstoy, uh, of Mark Twain. He um, had been a guest of uh, Mark Twain on his visits to the United States. He is one of those uh, Russian dissident um, not necessarily militant revolutionaries, but definitely a Russian uh, reformer that Americans embrace. And of course, a, a figure in, in the arts. He is uh, a major writer, uh, like I say, on the level of uh, Mark Twain and, and, and Tolstoy in his um, era. He's, um, of course, known for, uh, you know, all these pithy, quotes when everything is easy one quickly gets stupid or a good man can be stupid and still be good but a bad man must have brains weak souls need lies he is um, an international figure he here he is with another great uh russian superstar uh Shalapin, the um Russian opera singer. And so he is this, this figure, but um, he will be, of course, targeted by the conservative American press. He, um, in this notorious time when he's visiting Mark Twain in, in, in New York, um, he comes with a girlfriend who he introduces as his wife to everybody and Hearst newspapers expose the fact that he actually his real wife is back at at home and that the woman who Gorky is introducing as his wife is actually his his mistress although with his wife's approbation they they kind of had a a um uh, amiable separation amicable separation uh, but nonetheless the hearst newspapers make such a big deal of this kind of um russian revolutionary immorality uh, that uh, maxim gorky finds himself being expelled uh booted out of the hotel he was staying in in uh, manhattan other hotels won't uh, accept him as a guest as a guest with his um with his mistress and and and, and so forth so um, you know all these little political issues are being played out kind of in the world of the arts and international cultural exchanges and um hg wells of course intervenes on maxim gorky's uh, behalf it's 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 it makes Maxim Gorky certainly this very important symbol in Russian uh, reform. Um, and of course, once the Bolsheviks take power, and once Lenin is dead and Stalin now comes to power, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead here, so I'll, I'll just take you to the end of um, certainly Maxim Gorky's relevance to those early meetings in Capri with Lenin and Maxim Gorky's support of, of, of Lenin in those early, early stages of the rise of the Bolshevik party. Um, Stalin now co-opts Gorky um, as a symbol of, of, of kind of this humanitarian acceptance of Stalinist powers, because of course Gorky, like Tolstoy, is seen as this great um, humanitarian reformist. And Stalin now puts a tight grip on, on Gorky, and, and of course you get this famous photograph of um, Stalin sitting with Gorky on the steps of Lenin's tomb shortly before a uh, parade on the Red Square. Uh, and this kind of 
almost intimacy between um, the boss, as Stalin will become known in Russia, and um, the poet laureate of, of, of Russia, Maxim Gorky, it, it becomes an iconographic image um, in Russia that Stalin uses often to uh, kind of cloak his own crimes with this kind of approbation he seems to getting with, with Gorky. And, and certainly Gorky is up there on um, the podium during the Red uh, Square parades, uh, along with Molotov, as you can see, the foreign minister of uh, Russia. So we're looking here at the late uh, 1930s, probably 1935, I, I, I would suspect. Because what's going to happen is, is, of course, Gorky is no idiot. Uh, he becomes aware of the purges of the millions of people that Stalin is murdering at, at, at home. And uh, you can almost see it in his face in this uh, photograph. He has completely become disillusioned with, with, with Stalin. And because of the Stalinist kind of purging of historical archives and of history itself, we really aren't quite sure as to the truths of the legends that Gorky at one point began confronting Stalin over his policies. Gorky apparently did want to now leave Russia again. He had been, as they say, in exile while he was living in Capri in the early 1900s after the 1905 revolution. Stalin, of course, won't let him go. And um, of course, 1936, uh, just before the great terror, before the great purges that Stalin will unleash, where he'll arrest approximately one and a half million Russians um, and Ukrainians and other peoples in the Soviet Union in a period of 18 months, um, Gorky succumbs to a still mysterious death. Uh, and of course, Stalin and Molotov are his uh, Paul Bearers. And, and we'll probably never know the truth because, um, you know, whether Stalin cho chose to have Gorky murdered now rather than being humiliated by a public confrontation with G Gorky or whether Gorky fortuitously, um, uh, you know, for, for Stalin died on his own. But in any case, that's kind of the importance of, of Gorky for both Lenin's um, being hosted by him way back in uh, 1908 in Capri to um, his uh, kind of co-option by, by Stalin. And, and that's important of course, as well in Stalin's international relations at, at, at that time. Um, you know, Gorky's kind of public humanitarian face was something that Stalin hid behind in trying to present revolutionary Russia as, as a kind of becoming um, a more conventional state. But we'll get to that when, when we get to that era. In the meantime, uh, Tsar Nicholas, despite these disasters in Japan, and, 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 and of course, the, the, the disaster that occurs with the war in 1905 has less to do with the supremacy of Japanese naval power, but more with the kind of incompetence and corruption of the Russian military, the defense ministry, and just the government in general. Nonetheless, um, granting some minor reforms that he will very quickly um, restrict again, Tsar Nicholas II remains in power with the same corrupt circle of fools and incompetence that um, have been guiding him um, all along. And of course, they're going to guide him now uh, towards a situation in which Russia will find itself sucked into this misbalance of power that's going to occur with the rise of Germany and will result in, in, in the First World War. He will maintain his autocratic 
power right to the bitter end. The problem for everybody, of course, has been um, in Europe, um, has been the rise and fall of the Ottoman Empire and the expansion of um, Ottoman, Ottoman Islam. Here you can see the, the Turkic Ottoman tribe um, in 1300 it just had a small corner of what we today would call Turkey. Uh, they begin to expand uh, by 1451. Uh, of course, as uh, Constantinople, today Istanbul, falls to Ottoman uh, Turks. Um, the Ottomans expand into the European continent and onto the Black Sea, into Crimea, into regions that are part of Russia and the Ukraine today. Um, into North Africa, and they begin pushing at uh, the gates of Budapest. And so it's really by 1683, the Ottoman Empire is reaching its, its, its zenith. It, um, most of, um, it's, it's, you know, at the gates of, as I say, of Vienna by now. Um, and it's only, um, around 1792 that we find that the Ottoman Empire has been pushed back uh, in what is today um, Wallachia, Transylvania in that region and of course Catherine the Great has been pushing um, the Ottomans out of uh, southwestern um, Russia, out of the, the uh, Caucasus and onto the Black Sea and into Crimea, a process that I had described in previous lectures. Um, the Ottoman Empire continues to shrink and you begin to see that the European uh, regions uh, are becoming um, vacated of uh, Ottoman power. And of course, nations are beginning to rise up there. Uh, the Greeks, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, um, to the point that by 1914, this is what the Ottoman Empire looks like. It's, it's very much reduced. Um, the process of the rise of those uh, nations take place in a series of wars that uh, the Russians are indirectly in, 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 in involved with, a number of Balkan League wars. Um, this results, these, these, these very bloody wars are often fought um, partly against the Turks, but also um, with each other as Greeks. Um, go to war um, with the Turks, seizing further um, territory. And then the, the Greeks, of course, go up against the Macedonians who have a claim on the same uh, territory. So they're all fighting e each other. Uh, and the Russians, in the meantime, are searching out their main chance in all this um, chaos to find a way to somehow perhaps outflank that narrow exit they have through the Dardanelles, perhaps in another way. And, and, and so we see in that pre-First World War period, we see um, the emergence of Serbia as an uh, independent country, free of the Ottomans. Uh, Greece emerges in its rudimentary sense, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Montenegro, uh, Bosnia, and um, of course, then you have those those wars, Balkan wars with the Bulgarians and Serbians. Of course, uh, now pushing the Turks out of Albania as the Greeks as well come up from the south, and 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 so you get the formation of uh, what is uh, similar to modern Greece today and Albania. At issue is Bosnia. Um, the moment that um, the Turks leave Bosnia, the Austro-Hungarians move in and make it a protectorate. The Serbs are desperate for access to the sea and at the moment only have it through this narrow strip you can see at Montenegro. The Serbs make a historical claim on Bosnia and Croatia, claiming that that's all part of um, old uh, Serbia, ancient Serbia. 
and and of course the Russians are co-religious with the Serbians as they are with the Bulgarians and Romanians who are, and Greeks who are Orthodox. So that certainly uh, ties the Serbian people with uh, the Russian people. Both have a very similar Slavic uh, language. Uh, they both have again um, an uh, Orthodox religious uh, history, and 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 so there is this kind of um, ethnic affinity. But of course, the key thing, as you can see, if um, the Russians can kind of co-opt Romania to their side and and maintain Serbia as an ally, this gives Russians, of course, an exit into the Adriatic Sea if the Serbs can get Bosnia and, and, and the coastal areas. And, and, and so the Russians now begin to um, back Serbia at, 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 at this point. The response from Austro-Hungary is to just seize Bosnia and incorporate it into Austro-Hungarian, um, into the Austro-Hungarian empire as a territory of its own. And this of course, sets up the incident that will trigger the First World War. It's not going to cause the First World War. Um, the reasons for the breakout of, of war are, are complex. It has to do with um, a rather long history of um, the rise of Germany after 1870, the balance of power, uh, Germany's need for colonies, Germany's buildup of its um, uh, uh, navy, and 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 uh, the emergence of Germany as 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 a new power. Remember, Germany is a new country; it only comes into existence um, in in 1870, and 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 so. Um, Prussia becomes essentially uh, Germany, or, 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 although a lot of Germans will will argue against that. Um, nonetheless, uh, Prussia will dominate both the German economy and the German foreign policy and the German military. Uh, Bavarians, Württembergers, and Saxons, and other uh, Hessians. Um, tend to have other interests. Um, it's essentially uh, the kind of military identity that we often associate with First World War Germany and Second World War uh, Nazi Germany is, is more of a Prussian identity. Um, in fact, Winston Churchill will always uh, talk about how um, Germans are not the problem, it's the Prussians. Uh, in, in any, any uh, uh, regards, this rise of Germany and this uh, kind of desire by Serbia to expand its uh, newly found independence from the Ottoman Turks and, and the desire by powers like Austro-Hungary to seize the territory that the Ottomans are vacating in, 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 in that newly created uh, vacuum is uh, going to lead to this um, incident. Um, uh, Dragutin Dimitrievich, the head of Serbian army intelligence, known by his code name Apus, the B, is going to now form a secret society called Unity or Death. It's um, a modeled on the anarchist movements, and 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 so its tools are uh, poison, the dagger, and and bombs. It's also known as the Black Hand. Uh, you know, don't confuse that with um, uh, the Mafia Black Hand in the United States. It is essentially a uh, Serb nationalist arm of the Serb army. It's a clandestine arm, and it, be it begins to organize cells in, uh, in Bosnia itself. And so here um, is Gavrilo Princip, uh, 
He is a Bosnian Serb ethnic who joins the Black Hand Society, is uh, trained in uh, Serbia and then sent back to Bosnia along with fellow uh, assassins in 1914 on the visit of um, the Archduke Ferdinand, the um, heir to the Austro-Hungarian uh, throne. And um, uh, Archduke Ferdinand, kind of like Alexander II, is a reformist. Um, Austro-Hungarian Empire is a multicultural um, empire. It's predominantly ruled by Hungarians and Austrians in a partnership. However, there are multiples of ethnicities um, over a hundred different um, ethnicities in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and and um, Archduke Ferdinand is suggesting that perhaps uh, there should be a more multicultural sharing of power um, in in the new Austro-Hungary, and that uh, Bosnians in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as an ethnicity, um, should have a certain voice, and this, of course, alarms. Um, Serb nationalists because they now begin to fear that perhaps the Austro-Hungarians will successfully co-op um, the Bosnian population into remaining in the Austro-Hungarian Empire rather than uh, falling under under the Serbs and and so he and his wife on a visit to Sarajevo um, in the summer of 1914 are targeted for assassination as they drive in this vehicle through the town. And this assassination, as I say, is not the cause of the First World War, but it certainly triggers it. Gavriel Princip, of course, is arrested on the spot. He will be tried in Austro-Hungary and uh, he will be imprisoned at uh, Theresienstadt. Um, Theresienstadt, of course, is uh, notorious in the Second World War uh, as, as um, a, a kind of concentration camp for um, privileged, uh, Jews, those that might be prominent or, or have an um, enormous amount of wealth that they've successfully hidden outside the axis of Nazis. So um, it's, it's, it's a notorious concentration camp that is supposed to have uh, kind of like a minimum security concentration camp that is not as brutal as others. But that's where um, he ends up with in, the, in that um, concentration camp. Theresienstadt, I think, ends up being in Czechoslovakia in the end when all the borders are rearranged and that's where Gavrilo Princip will, will eventually die in uh, Theresian Stad, I think from tuberculosis. And of course for Serb nationalists, he remains to this day a, um, a, a martyr essentially for um, Serbia. But this is going to lead Europe to war. Um, the Russians, between 1905 and the outbreak of the Second World War in 1914, of course, have aligned themselves with France now, uh, as Germany is, is a growing threat. And as a result, the French are financing the, Germ the Russian railway in the West in order that um, uh, the Russians can deploy troops if necessary in the French aid, if the French go to war with, with Germany. Uh, Germany, of course, uh, begins to form its own treaty alliances. Germany is investing huge amounts of money in building the Turkish railway kind of outflanking the Suez Canal that is now built. And uh, Britain, of course, is troubled by the German presence in the Ottoman Empire. And of, of course, now the Germans begin to trouble the British more than the Russians in terms of being a, a, a threat along with the Turks. 
to the road to India, um, including now the Suez Canal. And so what happens is, of course, um, in, in the weeks following the assassination, Austro-Hungary now threatens Serbia. Uh, Serbia is, um, all sorts of ultimatums are issued. Um, unless the Serbs give up their operatives that they had uh, sent to Bosnia or had escaped Bosnia, unless the Serbs allow uh, Austro-Hungarian investigators into Serbia to search out the assassins and um, renounce all claims on, on Bosnia, the Austro-Hungarians now threatened, uh, threatened to crush Serbia. And the response, of course, from the Russians is immediate and historic. And, um, you know, what will still, still as I speak today, the Russian uh, Serb alliance remains very much still intact today. And, and uh, you know, we'll see certainly um, in the eastern Ukraine, we'll see there are a lot of Serb volunteers. Um, from the old remnants of this society of uh, unity or death that I had described, it, it continues to exist and takes very different uh, manifestations during the Second World War and, and, and so forth. And, and you still see unity or death um, operatives working in Russia today as uh, kind of mercenaries in the Eastern uh, Ukraine. In any regards, uh, back then in 1914, um, the Russians now immediately join the Serbs and guarantee Serb security that if the Austrians attack Serbia, the Russians will attack Austro-Hungary. And that, of course, triggers now Germany to join Austro-Hungary. Uh, and, and, of course, now you suddenly have this um, confrontation between Austro-Hungary uh, versus uh, the Russians, and now the French respond by, by joining in with the Russians on ultimatums issued to both Germany and Austro-Hungary. And now it's left to England to choose, really, because England has, um, although it's clearly favoring um, France, historically France has always been a rival of England for over a thousand years, while Germany has been, um, you know, in Prussia, the, the Hesha, for example, the natural ally of the United Kingdom, but uh, things had changed over the last 30 years since the um, departure of Bismarck as the Chancellor of, of, of Germany and uh, Wilhelm II was a very aggressive uh, Kaiser, some say mentally ill on, on, on top of that. And, and so the Germans had successfully um, alienated the United Kingdom by the time 1914 rolls around. And, and so um, Britain now makes this fateful decision uh, to join in with France and Russia against Germany. And, and, and of course, all the other countries now have to roll one way or the other. Uh, Bulgaria joins the central powers, Austro-Hungarians and, and Germans. Um, Italy joins the allies. Uh, the Ottoman Turks join the Germans. And uh, Romania will remain neutral. And, and, and that's the lineup for uh, the First World War as uh, one clicks off the next one as the next one triggers the next one and all kind of in a line they blindly follow each other uh, into this catastrophic apocalyptic uh, war and um, August 1914 this war now breaks out Russian propaganda, of course, once again, typically um, celebrates its impeding crushing of the German army. Nothing of the sort, of course, will occur. Uh, 
as much as Russian artists portray the new Russian military as this new powerful uh, rising power that's going to crush not only the Germans, but um, uh, the old enemies, the, the, the Turks that the Russians have been at war with um, for over a century now. Um, uh, they're going to flick um, the Germans off like a flea, according to this propaganda. Um, the Tsar, of course, takes on hands-on leadership in the war. even dresses up in a Russian infantryman's uniform, dresses his son in military gear. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the Tsar is no less an nincompoop then than he was uh, back then. In fact, he's worse now. Uh, uh, of course, um, he's just pulled apart by various corrupt ministers and advisors. Um, you, know, you know, we've all heard of the story of the mad monk or Rasputin in his court as well, although I don't think Nicholas II was particularly influenced by Rasputin. Uh, just his presence there, uh, of course, signals once again to Russians a kind of a corruption, incompetence in, in, in the court. And essentially, uh, the Russian war effort um, results in uh, extraordinary deaths. The Russian army has not become any more effective, any more efficient um, than it had been in uh, the 1905 war with Japan. And uh, Russia now goes on this precipitous fall now um, into death and war and disaster that will eventually, of course, trigger uh, two more revolutions um, in 1917. In the meantime, um, Woodrow Wilson had been elected president of the United States, a Democrat. Uh, he was elected on a, a neutrality policy. He's going to keep the United States out of European politics, kind of returning back to uh, the old kind of almost Monroe Doctrine um, concept, although that is not going to, of course, uh, touch on China or American interests in the uh, Pacific at all. But as far as European wars are concerned, the United States intends to uh, remain strictly neutral. And there is a powerful cultural and political uh, consensus in the United States that we don't need to get involved in this bloodbath unfolding in um, Europe. Neutrality, um, of course, uh, there is kind of a support. Again, um, you know, there's an American ambulance service in, in Russia. Americans are volunteering um, as, as, as well. Um, that Russophile faction in American foreign policy is uh, still a powerful one. Um, and, and, and so there are some efforts um, from civilian Americans to involve the United States in war efforts, um, but primarily um, while the United States kind of is, is uh, claiming, you know, peace on earth and goodwill towards men behind its position of neutrality, in reality, it has become an arsenal for Britain, France, and Germany, and the Russians um, the United States, of course, is making a fortune now supplying all the belligerents in this uh, war, while at the same time they're maintaining their um, neutrality. And so it's only um, in 1917 that the United States will enter into the war as um, German U-boats, 
um, launch unrestricted warfare where they begin uh, to attack American shipping that is, or, or, or British shipping even, sailing from American ports. They begin to attack uh, these uh, ships that are often supplying um, Britain. Britain, of course, has managed to isolate the United States from Germany with a blockade. So that that further, of course, now will exasperate German attacks on on shipping since um, there's no more risk of them um, interrupting their own supply lines since uh, the British Navy has successfully done this in the blockade. And, and so American vessels, American shipments end up now being targeted in this unrestricted warfare. And um, the final piece de resistance is um, a British intelligence leak, um, you know, of the Zimmerman uh, telegraphic complex story I, I described in courses on espionage, so I won't get into the details here, but essentially um, Americans discover that um, Germany is exploring the possibility of co-opting Mexico to join her in an attack on the United States. And that will bring, of course, uh, United States into the war in um, April of 1917. And now um, we're on the brink of the Russian Revolution. Uh, at, at this moment, um, Americans, Russians, British, and French are allied together against Germany and Austro-Hungary, uh, but things are now going to rapidly go out of control and change. Um, 